It is very peaceful here with the birds singing sweetly and the water flowing softly over the rocks. I can think here, even though Papa says it's not safe for me to think, that is. The only one that she'll know of this spot is my sister's. It'll be our spot. We are both getting older and we'll probably not have much more time together. And I said that because we were getting of the age that, you know, it was going to be to marry. And so, like, our, our time as sisters in the same whole household was coming to an end, and we knew that was, that was happening. Well, I was known as the black sheep of the family growing up. I questioned everything, and that was not okay. <laughs> You're expected to do everything your father says, you know, and never question and not think. My father, he wanted one thing for all of us. If we didn't fit in that goal, then we were less favored. Right around 10, our belief system just started getting more and more conservative and we became more and more ingrained in the patriarchy movement. And that's when our style of dress changed. It's almost like we started living back in time. Father is the head of the household and you know, the mother is his help meet. And our place is to help our fathers and our brothers you know, until our time comes that we're married off. The concept of marriage, the concept that I was going to get married, was a conversation that we started to have right around the time I was maybe 11. I told my aunt that I was gonna have it so easy because I wouldn't have to pick my spouse because my father would do it for me. You know, by 13, I was going through curriculum as part of the homeschooling that was designed to train me a for how a wife should think and the responsibilities a wife should have and that as a woman it's a sin to do anything that is outside of your husband's wishes. It wasn't long after I turned 18 that I, my father first said, I think I found you a spouse. I was kind of a creative kid. I loved to draw. I had a pretty active imagination. I wanted to play sports. I wanted to run in track, but in track you had to wear shorts. Since I grew up in so many different places, uh, I think it was hard to find a real identity of who I was. My dad, in his teenage years, he went through a period where he was struggling with his religious identity a little bit. He joined this group and he got really deeply involved. I think that was part of the reason that my mom wanted to leave. She didn't necessarily agree with the group and its practices. I think as he got closer and closer to, to kind of the leadership, he got more extremists. We were taught to kind of obey without questioning. That was early on kind of like ingrained, like you don't question, you don't question what the Sheikh says, you don't question what he does. He kind of went from being a really caring person to, you know, somebody I just didn't know. I didn't know him anymore. Even though she wasn't religious, she had very strong morals. She always told me that education was important. My freshman year of high school was really when I decided to just buckle down and um, focus on having kind of a goal in mind of, of who I wanted to be. Had I stayed with my mom, I would have probably continued on that path. 
My freshman year had just ended. It was summer. I was 15. When my mom found out that I kind of had a quote unquote boyfriend, she flipped out a little bit. She had a conversation with my dad. My dad wanted me to go out there to visit him that summer. I didn't really want to go. I wanted to stay with my mom. My dad sat me down and told me that you're not allowed to have sex out of marriage and you're gonna get married. And it wasn't like a question. <laughs> it was like, you're gonna get married. I understand forced marriage because I myself was coerced into a marriage when I was a teenager. But I was not a child, I was 19. I am Freddie Reese, I am the founder and executive director of Unchained At Last. My goal was to help women who were either facing a forced marriage or already in a forced marriage and needed help getting out. And I was shocked when more and more girls under the age of 18 were calling and asking for help. In the insular, ultra-Orthodox Jewish community in Brooklyn, where I was raised, I was groomed basically from infancy to become a wife and a mother. I attended an all-girls religious school where I received a limited education that focused on God and cooking and sewing. I actually had to sign a paper when I was in high school promising not to take driver's education or college entrance exams. I was considered in some ways to be a rebel, although I cringe now at what I thought was rebellious back then. I thought I was so bad because I would wear knee socks over my tights sometimes under my long pleated skirt. Uh, I'd go to school and I would get caught and I would get into big trouble you wearing knee socks over your tights because then when you glance at it, it looks like I'm wearing only knee socks without the tights. I mean, that was considered, you know, that was a big no-no. We'll get suspended for this. I often think I should write a whole book just about what Halloween was like in the Orthodox Jewish community in Brooklyn. It was, <laughs> now I can laugh, at the time it wasn't funny. They would let us out of school early and send us home because they told us very soon the Gayim are gonna come to your house and try to kill you. And we would go home in a panic and we would lock the doors and close the blinds and shut the lights and of course what would happen? Somebody would ring the bell and it was somebody wearing a costume and we were convinced that it was the Gayim coming to kill us. It's very effective, that type of brainwashing and that type of uh, education, because I internalized that and I stayed very far from the Gayim. I stayed very far from the other. I stayed very far from the outside world because there was no place for somebody like me in that outside world. My upbringing was so separated from boys and from men, I had very little interaction. Just looking at the prayer book, I knew that boys and men make a blessing every morning thanking God for not making them a non-Jew or a slave or a woman. And I knew that because it was in my prayer book too. So I would thank God for not making me a non-Jew or a slave. But then in tiny letters under where, where the men were saying, thank you for not making me a woman, I was thanking God for making me as he willed. Even Jewish law, it was very limited what we learned. It was only what you need to run a Jewish household. What we were told is if you have a question, you're supposed to ask your father or your husband or a rabbi. The expectation for marriage is you are going to marry and you're not gonna find your own husband. The matchmaker is going to find you a match. The matchmaker gets paid only if the match turns into an engagement. So the matchmakers are very, um, have a vested interest in making sure that this turns into an engagement. My match was a Coca-Cola guy, and I don't drink soda anymore, but back then I was a Coca-Cola girl. We both came from very poor families, which is why the matchmaker matched us. So how could this go wrong? <laughs> 
And when I first saw him, he was not at all what I had pictured, not at all the way the matchmaker had described him to me. You spend a few hours together over a period of a few weeks in a very non-intimate setting, and you have the matchmaker pushing, so is this a yes, is this a yes? And you have your, um, in my case, it was my mother. My father wasn't in the picture. My mother's saying, well, you know, we, we, already did the, we already did the research. I mean, how much more do you need to know? You just start becoming convinced, and you start going along with it, and you start saying, well, you know, these concerns I have, I'm just being picky, I'm being stupid, what do I really know? You know, the adults around me made this decision, and they said it's the right thing. A forced marriage is one that takes place without the full and free consent of one or both parties. And it typically involves one or more elements of force or fraud or coercion. Those complex relationships of love and abuse are really hard to navigate. And so as a young person or even as a 25 year old, if you've grown up in that same household and you don't have a lot of independence, those threats are incredibly powerful. They're often the ones that get people to give in. Coercion in our cases can take so many different forms, and some of the most powerful coercion comes in the form of emotional abuse and emotional coercion. We also see situations where individuals have grown up not able to get jobs or make friends outside of their family, and then they're told if they refuse, well, you'll get kicked out and you'll be dead to us. You have no safety net, and you have no experience, and you have no income of your own. The threat of being kicked out, again, incredibly powerful. I want to be a single woman missionary and travel the world helping people. And I told my parents this, and my father's like, oh, you just want to get out of the house. You know, that's not really what the Holy Spirit's telling you to do. You're not strong enough. You're not wise enough. You're not grounded in your faith enough to go out on your own. You'll just be tempted and fall into sin. To be told that really that's not what your heart's desire is and that you're just lying is crushing. One day, my parents called me up and they're like, oh, we've got somebody for you. I knew, like, oh, I have to give up all of those thoughts and all of my dreams because now I have to do this. After a couple of weeks, my father said, okay, you need to make a decision. You need to decide if you're going to marry this person or not. Don't forget that, you know, we're really expecting you to do the right thing. I hope you're not thinking selfishly. You need to be thinking of your siblings and of your cousins and of being a good example. Just remember that to disobey God is to be rebellious, and rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. You know, do you want to be a witch? The decision really boiled down to leave your family and your faith and be an outcast and essentially be condemned to hell or do the right thing and retain your family, your faith, your community and you know, make God happy, make your parents happy. Nobody ever said, if you say no, we're going to kill you. Nobody ever said that. But I knew what would happen if I said no. If I said no, I probably would remain stuck forever single in a community where being single was very shameful. And that was, to me, a fate in, in many ways worse than death. I was just so happy. I was just so happy and so excited and so ready for what I thought I knew was going to happen to me. And, wow, I don't know why that's bothering me, but. You know, when I look back, that's, that's one of the things that bothers me the most is how could, I have, how could I have been so gullible that I went along with this so happily? How, you know, where was rebellious Frady that day? One of the mornings I was taken aside, I just remember 
him telling me like that person over there is has been chosen for you. He was older than me. So it wasn't like I was talking to a peer. It was more like I was talking to an adult. I just remember him saying, I don't want to have an engagement. I just want to get married. I didn't really know what to say. So I didn't say anything. <laughs> you know, I wish I had. The leader of the group was there and he was going to perform my marriage. And so that was like a really big honor for my family, um, for my dad. On my way up, I remember asking somebody like, well, um, well, where am I gonna sleep tonight? Because I was thinking, oh, do I need to like bring clothes or something? And no, like they just looked down on the ground. The focus was on me. I had never been the focus of so much attention. And especially in this type of setting, you know, you're kind of just, you're just a child, you know, you just be quiet. I never thought to question. I, I never thought that I had the power to question. Where I, I had come from, that was kind of the norm. I mean, you just listened. You didn't really ask a lot of questions. And especially in this setting, it was a place to ask questions. This was a place to obey and, you know, do what you were told. So I guess I felt like for once my dad was proud of me. Um, and he wasn't ashamed of me. And I, I, I wanted him to be proud of me. During and after the ceremony, I was not allowed to talk to my mom. They basically had me call my mom and uh, lie to her on the phone and tell her a story of, you know, that I was, I wanted to live with my dad. Then I was just kind of handed over to this person who I didn't really know. I just became his. I was 15, he was 28. I was upstairs in my bedroom and my mom called up the stairs that he'd arrived. And my reaction was, oh, wonderful. And I started walking down the stairs and then all of a sudden I stopped. I don't feel anything. I should be feeling butterflies. I haven't felt any butterflies. There's no excitement. I'm acting excited, but I'm not excited. I don't want this. And then I got called again. Where are you? And so I pranced down the rest of the way down the stairs, like, oh, it's so good to see you. And, and yet this feeling inside that I was dying. You're going through the motions. It was almost like a play, like you're performing in a play. The door shut behind the bridal party right before I was going to walk down, and my dad put the veil over my face. Papa, are you proud of me? And he looked at me and just said, Nina, I am so proud of you. You look beautiful. And I was on cloud nine. <laughs> I was elated because that's all I had ever wanted to hear from him. And then the doors opened and we walked down the aisle. There was a lot that day that was, you know, exterior that I focused on versus what was really going on inside. The reality, that kind of like wake up moment was, you know, when he's like, okay, you may now kiss the bride. And, you know, having the veil lifted over my face and going in for that first kiss and wanting to just be cherished and to feel gentleness. And instead there was, it was a very long kiss because it was, you know, 
trying to force his tongue down my throat was really the first indication of what was going to follow. Consummating the marriage didn't have to happen the first night. That was going to be his instructions. And then my father followed it up with, but don't make him do that. That's being selfish. He's looking forward to this. Don't disappoint him. Hearing this voice in my head, like, you have to do this, you know, and you don't want to disappoint. To be essentially just taken and just laid down. And instead of having somebody discover you and want to know you and to explore your skin, you have somebody that just uses you without regard to what it feels like for you. My body is not my own any longer. Now it belongs to him. And feeling like I didn't really want to share it, but had to, because there's no alternative. I'm his wife now. We were kind of bouncing around from household to household. We stayed with, at my dad's house for a while, and then we went to his brother's house, and then we went to the Sheikh's house, and then various households. I was 16, and I was about seven months pregnant. We ended up driving up to Reno. It was about like a four-hour drive. We ended up having like a civil marriage there. He had a, a letter from my dad kind of like a permission slip that you would send your kids to school with. So yeah, that's all it took in the state of Nevada. I was very pregnant, so um, that's clearly evidence of, of, of a rape, of statutory rape. Nobody asked me about that. I was never questioned. Not even once. Child marriage is not just a problem that occurs in countries on the other side of the globe, but it happens right here in our own very backyard. Child marriage is forced marriage and signifies a pervasive discrimination against young girls. Like victims of human trafficking and domestic violence, Victims of child marriage are forced and condemned to a life that they did not choose with no means of escape, resulting in physical and mental health problems, loss of education and economic opportunities, and an increased likelihood of experiencing violence. Even though at that time we didn't know what the term forced marriage was, we knew that she was being pressured on all sides. Even though we didn't know what the term child marriage was, we knew that she was going through it. And even though we didn't know the term domestic violence, we knew that she was marrying a man eight years older than her who can easily overpower and control her. And even though we didn't know the term victim, we knew that we had no way of preventing her from becoming one. Forced and child marriage is something people haven't talked about in the United States. And it's not something that I think people have realized until relatively recently. It does happen, how it happens, how many people it happens to. Up to this point, I think many people have been treating forced and child marriage as perhaps similar to the way domestic violence was treated 30 years ago or so. It's a private matter, it's a family matter, it's uh, sort of what that family does, it's within the home, it's not my business, it's not my role.
I was picked up from high school at the age of 14, right after school, and carried to the Justice of the Peace Court and married off to a 26-year-old man. I had the handcuffs actually put on me to marry my rapist. I was targeted as a vulnerable child and groomed. I suffered abuse, exploitation, entrapment, and manipulation. I found that this organization, Unchained at Last, to help people who are in or facing a forced marriage, and were almost always able to help the adults. But when girls, 17 or younger, call and ask for help, what's clear is that there's almost nothing that these girls can do to prevent themselves from being forced into a marriage. And there's almost nothing they can do once they're in the marriage to get out of it. Almost every U.S. state sets 18 as a minimum marriage age, but almost every state has exceptions. What those laws do, unfortunately, is they provide a number of exceptions to a minimum marriage age, which can provide loopholes for uh, individuals who are too young to be able to assert their rights for themselves, advocate for themselves uh, legally and practically. There are so many variations, and in some states, a child needs to go in front of a judge. In some states, they can just get married with a clerk's approval. And what we've seen is parents doing a Google search. There was a national news story last year, a girl from Idaho, 14 years old, who was raped and got pregnant. And her father wanted to marry her off to her adult rapist. He went online and he did a Google search and he thought, well, where can I marry off my daughter easily? Now, Idaho, I would say fairly easy there. In fact, of the 38 states where we collected the data, Idaho had the highest rate of child marriage. But what he discovered is that in Missouri, it's even easier. So he took her out to Missouri and in Missouri forced his 14-year-old daughter who had been raped and gotten pregnant to marry her adult rapist. What in the world are we doing? So our laws are setting up this this situation where girls can be abused and forced into a marriage, but can't take any of the basic steps necessary to protect themselves. The Tahrir Justice Center took a long, hard look at all 50 states and their minimum marriage age laws and the exceptions on their books. And we were really stunned many states, 27 states, where there is no lower age limit if the conditions set by statute, whether that's parental consent or judicial consent or pregnancy or some combination thereof, are met. Uh, but the variation among them, the kind of inattention, and frankly, the feeling in all of those laws that what was being prioritized was parental control and not child protection. The lack of concern that was embodied in these laws was really stunning when we looked at them. And so we put together a compilation of them and uh, really kind of exposed where those cracks and gaps and loopholes lie in the laws. I was approached by the Tahari Justice Center. A lot of their clients were coming to them who had been forced into marriage were trapped, were in abusive relationships, were looking for a way out. And they found that half of their clients were children. And they, they found that over a 10-year period, there were some really alarming statistics of how many girls, particularly under the age of 16, were married. Mr. Speaker, I'd ask the gentlelady um, if she can cite any specific cases in Virginia of the forced marriages of the minors that it has occurred. Uh, if the gentleman would like to hear, this was a 17-year-old um, who had suffered years of emotional, psychological, and physical abuse at the hands of her family in an effort to get her to agree to marry an older man that she barely knew and had not chosen for herself at a time in her life when she only wanted to focus on school and a wide-open future rather than marriage to a man that she didn't know. 
Child Protective Services tried to intervene, but they couldn't. She kept trying to cry out for help, but she couldn't get a protective order because she was underage. The way the law in Virginia was, if you were 16 or 17, you could get married with your parents' permission. If you were under 16 and the girl was pregnant, you could get married with your parents' permission. There was a defense on the books for carnal knowledge with a child 14 or younger if you married her. That was particularly disturbing where there's an abusive relationship. Because if you have a girl who is married in abusive marriage, she can't get out. She can't call Child Protective Services because child abuse is defined as between a parent and a child, not a husband and a wife. She couldn't go to a domestic violence shelter because most shelters would see a child show up alone and consider them to be a runaway. She couldn't file for divorce or seek a protective order because those are things that only adults have the right to do. So she was stuck. We saw that there was a provision that said once you're married, you could get emancipated by the court, which declares you legally an adult. So we said, why don't we flip it? If you're going to get married, you should be emancipated first. The pushback came, men mostly, who said, if my daughter gets pregnant, she better get married, or I want her to get married. And what struck me about that was, if your daughter is under 17 and she's pregnant, she's a victim of a crime. To remove a parental decision-making of their own minor, their child, ought to be compelling, overwhelming, compelling evidence that we are now removing that from parents. I think that to remove a parent's rights and responsibilities and giving now allowing the judge to make the decision over the parent. Is that really where we want our parental rights to come to? Um, I think that is a, a huge infringement on parental rights and responsibilities and that's why I will not support this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, in state after state, legislators have either rejected the legislation and said, no, thank you, I don't want to eliminate a human rights abuse that destroys girls' lives, or they've watered it down. So, yeah, we'll take out this exception, but we'll put in the other one and the other one and that one. And then, you know, we're the ones who get the calls from the girls. The day after the, the law passes, we get those calls. Now the girls under the new loopholes are being forced to marry. Save our children. 3091, we won't stop until it's done. 3091, we won't stop until it's done. A3091 had overwhelming bipartisan support in both houses of the legislature. The legislature passed Bill A3091 on March 13th, and Governor Christie issued the conditional veto May 11th. It was common sense, and then Governor Christie went and conditionally vetoed that bill. The reason that he gave is illogical. What he said is that uh, ending child marriage would somehow interfere with religious customs. I don't know about you, but I have never heard of a religion that requires child marriage. Attitudes toward sex play, I would argue, an inordinate role in the history of early marriage. One of the reasons that we have set our minimum marriageable age so low is because lawmakers are clearly very worried about girls, more so than boys, having sex outside of marriage. 
In the early 19th century, most Americans were not conscious of their ages, and even if they were, it was not a central component of their identity in the way it is for us now. We all know how old we are, we all have birth certificates, we all are permitted to do certain things only at certain ages. So people moved into adult roles when they were big enough or able enough or financially secure enough to do so. The marriage of people we would now call teenagers from the age of 12 through 18 was quite common in a variety of locations. It did not attract all that much attention. Girls, the only stipulation really was that they had achieved puberty, um, that their parents were willing, um, or if they were orphans, that someone was uh, allowing this to happen, and that they were uh, capable of keeping a house. During the 1950s, the rates of minor marriage, particularly for middle-class, urban, suburban, white girls, the age of first marriage went way down. It is, was the lowest in the 20th century. Obsessed with obtaining the domestic ideal during this moment. Um, so this is the era of uh, leave it to beaver and father knows best. The way to be patriotic and to express your patriotism and your anti-communism was at least in part through establishing the ideal American home. Uh, young people were taught in marriage and family living classes in their high schools um, how to be husbands and wives. Sexual standards have been changing from the early 20th century, especially during the 1920s. So boys and girls, teenagers of both sexes, were experimenting more sexually in dating. One of the consequences of this was actual intercourse and then sometimes pregnancy. But we were still at a moment when especially middle-class white folks were not comfortable with the notion of out-of-wedlock pregnancy um, when abortion was illegal. Um, and so the result was a shotgun marriage. People think of a forced marriage as somebody holding a gun to the bride's head and saying, you are getting married today to this guy, like it or not. And nobody held a gun to my head. What you come to realize eventually, or what I came to realize eventually, is you don't have to hold a gun to somebody's head to force her to do something or to even convince her that it was her own choice to begin with. What choice do you have when this is what you were groomed for your entire life? And then to be told that I had the choice about whom to marry and, and convince me that this is a choice when, how could that possibly be a choice if it's, you can say yes to this guy the matchmaker brought to you, or you can face the terrible repercussions. What, what kind of choice is that? I never signed my marriage license, my Jewish marriage contract. Two rabbis signed that. I wasn't a party to my own marriage. I was given to my husband. It was a week after our wedding that he woke up late one morning and uh, you know, was enraged at himself for being late and started screaming and cursing. In this blind rage, he punched his fist through the wall, and then he ran out. And, and it was that moment I just stood there shaking and looking at that hole in the wall and thinking, the fact that he can do this over something as small as waking up late, I knew right then that that was a problem. I was still, you know, young. I was 19. I mean, I was still a teenager, and I didn't know him very well at the time. I had no reproductive rights. So I was not allowed to use birth control and I was required to have sex with my husband. 
So within two months, I was pregnant. I gave birth 11 months after my wedding to my first child. Immediately pregnant, and then pretty soon I have two kids, no, no money, no way to support them, no education to fall back on, and don't even have the legal right to leave my own marriage on my own. Really, the only way out would have been if my family would have taken me back in, and I could have moved back in with my mother and been an aguna, which means a, it's a chained woman, a woman whose husband won't divorce her. And yet when I asked my mother if I could do this, um, the answer was no. The answer was no. And, and in fact, her position was, you chose him. You chose this guy. There was never a period of time that I can remember that I didn't go without crying. Like, every day I probably cried. I called my dad kind of when I was at my worst. He's the one who got me into this mess. The least he could do was kind of help me figure out what I need to do next. At first he didn't really respond and then he was just like, well, you know, you should pray, God will help you. And it wasn't like, let me help you or let's figure this out together or what do you need? And I felt like it was his way of saying like, you deserve this kind of went back to my childhood, like I felt res really responsible for it. For a time, it was just me and my daughter. You know, I would be at home while my husband was working. I would take her out for walks and we would go around the neighborhood and I would see young girls my age walking to school. I thought I need to do something about this situation. In order to get into this program that I wanted to go to, I had to have my GED. So I started going to adult school. About halfway into the program, I found out I was pregnant again. And I was like pretty devastated. I wanted to talk to my mom. I called her and she came out. <laughs> she came out to see me like almost immediately. Up until that point, I think she didn't know where I was. She did come back into my life and she really encouraged me to continue to go to school. And so I kept going to school until I was like eight months pregnant. About three months after the wedding, um, I found out that I was pregnant. And of course it's expected that you get pregnant right away. I just remember taking the test and it was positive and I thought, no, it can't be. And then I took another one and it's positive. <laughs> I just remember for this one tiny brief thought that said, you're really trapped now. And then I quickly dismissed it because after all, I should be thrilled to be having a baby. He didn't really like me pregnant. You know, he didn't like what it did to my body. And because I wasn't as attractive, he'd be more prone to giving into temptations. And, um, you know, of course, that was my fault for not being available enough. The day my daughter was born, having her get laid on my chest, and I looked at her. And I thought, this is a little human being that just loves me for me. <laughs> and that was a gift that I hadn't had before. I just remember it was just really difficult because all of a sudden he wasn't getting all the attention. I had a daughter to take care of and had to nurse and my body wasn't available at all times to meet his needs and he started to really resent that. Got to a point where it didn't matter that I was nursing the baby. And I would just hide her and try and disconnect from that whole half of my body.
when you go through so many years of bottling up your emotions and, and tossing that bottle away, what you're left with is a shell that doesn't feel anything. Just this constant tight feeling in the chest every day. The headaches, the stomach aches, not being able to eat, just not feeling good. You know, and then every now and then having this lucid moment. I remember sitting on the edge of my bed one day and I was looking out the window and I just said, Lord, I am so utterly miserable. What do I do? Try and then talk to my dad, then it's, oh, you're just being dramatic or you're just overthinking it or, you know, well, if you didn't say no, then it's not assault. <laughs> it's the husband's right and duty to, to take what he wants. You know, so what, what's the problem here? You know, obviously you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. So there's always a comeback. There's always a dismissal. And of course, it, there's also a lot of, of shame in that. What we're talking about is forced consummation, which is rape. And honestly, I don't think a lot of people think about that when they think about forced marriage. I really have to drive home for people fundamentally what happens on a wedding night. We can assume that non-consensual sex follows a non-consensual marriage. When you're in a marriage, it's expected that you will have intercourse many, many times, that it will be regular and that it will be at the man's whim you find yourself in a situation where you're facing not only a rape on your wedding night, but ongoing sexual abuse and sexual assault within your marriage. Short-term devastating effects are abuse at the end of your education, isolation, sexual assault. The long-term effects are all of those things multiplied over years and feeling financially disabled and feeling incredibly, inextricably tied to this person. Uh, because of how long you've been forced to stay and the legal ways in which you're now tied to them through marriage, through children, etc. When you realize that the people that you look to as your protectors are more like your prison wardens, it's a terrifying thing when you realize that at any moment someone can just barge in and take your body. It's a terrifying thing. When you're a kid and then you're forced into something, uh, you don't know why it's wrong. You just feel like it is wrong, but you don't know why. And it takes you a really long time to figure out why and who you are. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, some girls just never even get there. When he first threatened to kill me, he would describe to me in detail how he was going to kill me. And it was, it was very graphic and very scary. I never had a black and blue mark. I never had a broken bone. And I think that that's part of why when I was, you know, trying to get help from my family, his family and rabbis, it was, you know, people with limited understanding of domestic violence who were saying, but did he beat you? No. He told me he's gonna kill me. But I mean, he's just young. I mean, that's what everybody was telling me. He's, he's a good person. And that was what several rabbis said to me. He's a gitta. He's just young. He just has to grow up a little bit. He'll settle down and he'll grow up and he'll be a good husband. I used to think the only way out is death. And I used to think, you know, maybe I'll die young and that will be my way out. This is the only way out of this horrible life that I've been stuck in.
There's something you need to know about me before I begin. I am dead. And I know what you're thinking. She doesn't look particularly dead, right? Well, you might want to tell that to my family. They declared me dead 13 years ago when I first took steps to escape the abusive marriage that they had arranged for me. When I was 27, still trapped in this terrible marriage, I secretly started seeing a therapist from outside of the community who for the first time explained to me what domestic violence was and, and also explained to me that I had legal rights, that the police would protect me from this man even though he was my husband, which is something I hadn't known. I believe I was the first person in the Orthodox Jewish community to walk into the police department in Lakewood, New Jersey and ask for a restraining order. The rabbi actually sent an Orthodox Jewish male attorney to my house who drove with me to family court and had me stand in front of the judge and tell the judge that I wanted to drop the restraining order. And it was that moment standing there and in my head thinking, no, I, I'm terrified. This man standing next to me is not my attorney. And not being able to communicate that to the judge, because how could I possibly explain that to the judge without putting myself in further danger? It clicked in my head that there is not a single person in the world who is on my side who is going to help me. Something is wrong, and I didn't know what it was. I couldn't put my finger on it. I couldn't identify it. It finally got to the point where even he noticed. And he's like, there's something wrong with Nina and went to my father and said, there's something wrong. She's not cleaning the house like she used to. She's not wanting to cook like she used to. She never wants to go out and do anything. She never wants me. What do we do? Oh, her mother went through this. We, she needs to see a counselor. That was my turning point. And that's when I first started recognizing that what I'd been dealing with all of these years was, you know, emotional and verbal and sexual abuse. She was the first person that explained to me what a bounded choice is and how you can be presented with these two choices, but really there's only one that is a feasible choice to take. You're at the edge of a cliff and they say, well, your choice is you can jump off and die, or you can come back to safety. And I could feel this terror building up inside of me. And I sat there and I braced myself. This was definitely forced. I did not want this. I do not want this. This is not my life. I did not choose this. I cannot stay here. I still felt trapped even though I was going to school, and even though I did have visions and goals for the future, I started to understand that I didn't want to be with him. The group really expressed a lot of dismay. Why do you need to go to school? Like, you don't need to do that. You're, you're a mom now, you know? You're, you should be at home with your daughter and taking care of your husband. That was kind of when I started really understanding that I didn't have to listen to them if I didn't want to. I was like, you know what? I don't need to do this anymore. I'm, I'm done, you know, I'm just done. The disassociative state pretty much disappeared and all the little voices in my head went away and I could just hear one voice. I couldn't leave overnight. I took five years where I not only saved up cash, but also um, I, I went online and I did a search for a college in New Jersey and found a school called Rutgers University um, that seemed like a good school and submitted my application and, and went. The plan was that he was gonna take the kids back to his parents' house for a while uh, while I got myself together. I didn't know my rights as far as divorce goes in the state of California. I was still a kid. I was 22 or 23 at the time, so I didn't know too much about life. I knew 
that I had to be very, very careful and that this was going to take some time and some planning. And then to see that growing desperation, you're being deceived, you know, allowing the devil to take control, you're not following God's will. He just thought I was being more and more distant. So I started like canceling my appointments last minute, stopped, you know, communicating himself with my counselor. Started saying, well, you're not going to see her anymore. Instead, I want you to see my pastor and your father and the pastor and I, we're going to figure it out for you. When you start to respond to a person with open eyes and to realize how much of the communication had been it's to get me confused, to get me to doubt myself. Now I wasn't doubting myself anymore and I was standing up for myself. I think his thought process was that, you know, she's just going to completely fail and come running back. But that didn't happen. I went to work, I rented a house that summer, and I got the kids enrolled in school. And that's when I filed for divorce. On Shabbos morning, he would go to shul, to synagogue, and he would uh, get drunk. And he would come home drunk in a rage, and he's pounding on the door. I'm sitting on the floor in my daughter's room. I have my arms around my daughter's. Suddenly just said, why, why am I taking this? Why am I sitting on the floor in the corner here cowering? This is ridiculous. So I stood up and I, and I yelled. I, I opened the door and I said to him, you have to stop screaming, stop cursing, stop threatening. And if you don't, I told him, I'm going to take the kids. And I don't care that it's Shabbos. We're getting in the car and we're leaving. If you openly violate the laws of the Sabbath in public, like driving in a car where everybody can see you, that's punishable by death. He didn't believe me, so he continued screaming and cursing and threatening. So I said, kids, get in the car, we're going. It took about six weeks to get everything ready. And in between that time, I was able to talk to a lawyer and get a restraining order, met with a local women's shelter to make a safety plan to leave. That was just a really nerve-wracking several hours. I had applied for a restraining order, and it had gotten approved, but had not been served yet. I'd kind of left a note that just said we had gone and that I was done and that I was not going to be manipulated and controlled and that I was going to be free and that I had left with the children and that we were going somewhere safe. We drove to the mall and my kids had watched only one movie in their whole lives at that time. Later when, you know, Sabbath was already over. I figured, you know, he's had enough time to process what I just did and to calm down, I hope. I figured I'll go back home and, you know, see what's going on. I came back home and he was gone. And so while he was gone, I changed the locks. And then when he came back, you know, he rang the bell, honey, I'm home. And I said to him, I have tasted life without you and it is sweet. You're not coming back. And that was it. I filed for divorce soon thereafter. Finding an attorney that was willing to work with me and said, you know, this really sounds like you have grounds for an annulment. This is going to be a, a really steep uphill battle. There's no guarantees that this is even going to happen. An annulment hadn't really been done before, not a civil one, and uh, particularly for forced marriage. There was no statutes, no case law that they could go by. So they would have to kind of keep defaulting to what they would do in a divorce, which really you know, doesn't help a forced marriage victim, somebody that's trying to get out of this. The judge did in fact see that there was evidence to grant an annulment and that there was grounds for it. My attorney was like, had this elated moment because he, he knew what the process was and I was still like hesitant to believe in it. And he's like, we're gonna get it. You know, we're gonna get it. <laughs> you know, you, you're gonna get the annulment. Now that this 
case is on the record, is on the books, other people can reference this case. There is now essentially like case law because, you know, because of this win. I really wish I had somebody that knew what they were doing, that could have advised me what my rights were at that point. And I thought for sure, like somebody would have said something like, oh, you were 15 when you got married. So I thought maybe there would have been some easy way out, but there wasn't. It was really hard. It, it took me three years to get divorced. My mom was a significant emotional support when I was trying to you know, rebuild my life. She was like, you know what, I'll help you with the kids. Go back to school, do what you need to do. I'm here for you, I'm your mother. Not everybody is as lucky and not everybody has that support. And that's, that's significant because that means that they're potentially trapped in marriages that they feel they can never escape. I started getting involved in advocacy about a year and a half ago. As I did my research, I found out that yes, in fact, it is okay for minors to get married in this state and there is no age limit. I feel really strongly that marriage should be for two consenting adults who actually really wanna get married <laughs> for all the right reasons. Um, there shouldn't be any coercion involved and coercion is um, easily happens with children uh, because they are children and there needs to be more protections out there and I, I won't stop talking about it until you know something changes. You know it was this really terrifying and exhilarating journey discovering the whole big outside world beyond the insular community where I had been raised. I mean, I, I didn't know the first thing about the world. I didn't know who the Beatles were. I didn't know what the Muppets were. And then also recovering from the, the trauma and, um, and rebuilding a life. Suddenly being alone in the world with just two daughters relying on me was, uh, was certainly scary. Uh, for a long time, maybe still scary. About six years ago, I got to the point where I was able to buy a small house for myself and my two daughters, uh, a little Cape Cod that we very ambitiously call the Palais de Triomphe. I'm fairly certain I'm the only woman in the history of my family ever to buy her own home. I do, um, I do love to run, I'm a runner. So that's how I keep sane and um, it's not always easy work here at Unchained at Last, as you can imagine. There are a lot of sad stories, a lot of sad stories and especially the children who call and ask for help and I'm unable to help them. And that really weighs on me. And um, so, you know, going, going for a run in the morning, a five mile run does wonders uh, for the soul. Getting out and feeling like, okay, I've just gotta be a single mom and that's gonna be my life. I'm gonna miss like never being able to really fall in love with somebody that I want to fall in love with. When love did find me, it kind of caught me by surprise. <laughs> to make that conscious choice and to feel like every day, I have a choice, you know, and every now and then he'll ask me and he'll be like, are you still okay? Is this still what you want? Because if it's not, you can totally walk away or we can go back to being friends and I'll still be here for you. My kind of go-to Zen place is just being in the kitchen. Uh, making food for people uh, who I really love and new friends and old friends and I just I love getting together around a meal Trying to see how many people are coming to my wedding in October. So I have some RSVPs here We've had a lot of time to plan this wedding. We really kind of uh, Set the date out pretty far because we wanted to just make it special and um, make it really count so 
much different <laughs> than the first go around. <laughs> I recall specifically a uh, young girl who was terrified, literally scared to death, could hardly speak. Uh, she was uh, 14 years old. Her mother was coming in to sign to give permission for her to be married. And she was there with a, uh, a male who was 27 years old. We have to pass legislation in all 50 states. Um, yeah, good thing I, I don't need to sleep a lot. Here's the problem. When a woman over age 18 reaches out, if she's facing a forced marriage or already in a forced marriage, we're typically able to help her. Well, if she is under the age of 18, if she leaves home, she's considered a runaway. The police will return her to her home. They might charge us criminally at Unchained At Last for helping. If we get her to a shelter, shelters will turn her away typically. They will not take in somebody under the age of 18. This isn't happening only in the community where I grew up. This is, this is a gender violence issue. A forced marriage is happening to women and girls in so many different communities and cultures and religions and socioeconomic levels. My name is Sarah, and I am a child marriage survivor. Um, I'm here in support of SB 273. There is no minimum age for marriage in the state of California. I'm pleased to speak today in strong support of House Bill 799 to end marriage under age 18 in Maryland. Until about 2011, forced marriage in the United States was a hidden problem. It was one uh, that we are only still seeing the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's been published, researched, studied, and made known. We are here to send a strong message to legislators and to the public that we are not going to stand for child and forced marriage. The fact that child marriage is still legal in this country, I think should say to all of us, we still have you know, serious work to do here at home, but also really undermines our credibility then as an advocate on the world stage. We can do this by finally ending early forced child marriage, an unjust, unfair, and archaic practice that is severely affecting the very core of our nation, the children of America. takes a lot of understanding of abuse and dynamics and family pressure to really understand what it can mean to be forced into marriage, even if there's no gun to your head. The strength, the heartbeat of this movement to end forced and child marriage in the United States really comes from those incredible survivors who step forward to help lead the movement, to tell their stories, to drive forward change, uh, to hold policymakers accountable. I do see hope for a future where there's recognition and acknowledgement of forced marriage and understanding that sometimes what people call arranged marriage is actually a forced marriage. I see a future where there's actually legislation and policy in place to, uh, to prevent what happened to me from happening to others and to help other women and girls who are trapped where I was once trapped.